different types of gene mutations. You know, we all inherit a gene from our mother and from our father. And in, in the case of LRRK2, it's known as dominant. So if one of your genes is, is, it has a mutation either from your mother or father, you, you know, 50%, you have 50% chance of getting the disease. So the disease is dominant. And the key thing is that the six mutations, you, you know, segregate with disease in the dominant. So even if you just have one copy of this, or one of these mutations, you're likely to develop Parkinson's disease normally over the age of 50 in, in this case. So uh, a little bit more information about LRRK2 before I go into the biology. You know, it's, a very, it's, it's relatively common. It, it's found about 1 to 2 percent of all Parkinson's patients. So it's one of the most common genes after this GBA mutation. So it's, it's relatively common. So the mutations cause late onset Parkinson's disease, very similar to the normal type of non-genetic Parkinson's disease. And there's been a lot of interest in LRRK2 since 2004. There's been 1,500 research papers to better understand this, you know, this enzyme. But despite all of this work, up till very recently, we had very little idea about how it behaved in, in biology. So what was really exciting is we and other groups demonstrated early on around 2005, 2006, that kinases you know, put phosphates groups onto proteins and the key thing was to identify is you know you can measure that activity and, and get a and get a get a get a get a what's called an activity of the enzyme and what was really critical was to work out how the mutations affected the ability of LRRK2 to put phosphate groups onto proteins and what was amazing was that it was found that the especially this very common pathogenic mutation the G2019S mutation this switched on LRRK2 and made it much more active than the normal enzyme was. So this was telling us that the disease was caused by an activation of LRRK2 in these patients. This was probably leading to abnormal levels of phosphorylation of a, of a protein in the brain, and this could be causing toxicity resulting in Parkinson's disease. So because of this, many pharmaceutical companies were very excited by this finding because this meant that if they could develop a drug that could target LRRK2 and inhibit its function, they could maybe reduce the overactivation that's caused by the mutation, i.e. counteract the toxic effects of the mutation. And uh, you know, maybe this, th th this could uh, re result in a reduction in the phosphorylation of that toxic protein in cells. And uh, you know, this could have therapeutic benefit for patients with Parkinson's disease. So, and, and this is a massive area of research. My lab's been very much involved. We, we, we don't work with one company. We work with any company that we want to. So we worked with probably nearly half a dozen companies now. And there's, there's, there are very advanced stages in developing drugs. And I'm told from, I went to a meeting in New York last week and it was announced that uh, there's at least six companies with very late stage preclinical compounds in development and, and, and it's expected in the next 18 to 24 months time, you know, clinical trials may start with LRRK2 inhibitors. So this is the structure, this isn't, the, this is the structure of a compound from GSK that's been reported and a compound from Merck. These, these are fantastic tool compounds for biologists to understand the function of LRRK2. You can give these to, to cells, neuronal cells, you can inject them into mice or other animal models of Parkinson's disease, and, you, and then they inhibit the pathway, the biology, and you can study how that, that impacts uh, you know, you know, you know, or, 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 you know, on the disease. And I think these companies are still tweaking the structures of these compounds. The, the, the precise molecular matter that's going to be used in the clinical trial is still at the, at the, at the secret stage. So, the key questions for us and for everyone else working in this field is, you know, what is the biology that LRRK2 is regulating to cause Parkinson's disease? You know, that was the, you know, the, 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 the 50 million dollar question. And, and what that means in terms of an enzyme like a kinase is you need to identify the key direct substrate that LRRK2 is targeting to trigger the disease. That is the, 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 key, the key experiment. And so we knew this in 2004, that everybody knew this in 2004. And basically the whole field, you know, hundreds of labs were working to try to identify 
this, this key substrate. And it turned out to be very, very difficult. And but we, we, you, we and others used all the tricks in the book to try to do this. And you know, we, we just couldn't crack this problem. We couldn't identify what the, the key substrate was. So by 2010, we, I realized that we really had to, you know, rather than just work as an individual lab tackling this problem, you know, we needed to work as a team. So to do this, you know, I, I, this is probably the, the most complicated and hardest project I've ever been involved in my life. I managed to get funding to put together uh, a team of, uh, of, of three different labs that are shown here. They run a technology called mass spectrometry. This is a very, very sophisticated chemical process where you can look for, you know, using, using advanced machinery for one protein in the cell that becomes over-phosphorylated when you have the mutation of LRRK2. So you have 30,000 proteins in your cell, cells and they're phosphorylated at many sites. So it's like having a bundle of maybe over 100, 200,000 you know, you know, chemicals and you've got to find the one that out of that, you know, that, 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 that bundle that is, that, is, that is overly phosphorylated. It's very hard to find. And then we, worked, we also worked with GSK and, and the Merck companies and also the, Martin, the Michael J. Fox Foundation were, were very helpful in, in enabling all of this. And so what we did is then we, the, the, the trick was to make genetically modified mice, where we put in the LRRK2 mutation into the natural gene of the mice. So we put in the mutations that mimic the, the, the Parkinson's disease, so it switches on the biology pathway. But we also made mutations that, that, that killed the kinase activity and switched off the pathway. And then we use this, this mass, mass spectrometry methodology to look for that one substrate that went up when you made the active disease-causing mutation and went away when you inhibited and you took out the LRRK2 enzyme. So that was, that was four years' work, and I, I, can't, can't, I, just, I just can't explain how much work and effort you know, went into this you know, from all the groups here. Uh, but you know, we, uh, uh, eventually, we published... In, um, in, in 2016, we, we discovered what the key substrate was. And then this is another enzyme known as, as, as RAB. And, and this was very, very exciting. So uh, LRRK2, in all these experiments, was to phosphor shown to phosphorylate this, this RAB enzyme that's been previous, previously implicated in Parkinson's disease. And I'll go on to that in many different ways at one critical, critical site. And this is a very complicated slide, but basically what RAB does, it's like the postman in the cell. You know, when you, you know, the cell has many different compartments. You've got, it's got membranes, it's got nucleus, it's got other organelles scattered around the cells. And, 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 and things like vesicles and, 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 and other sugars and compounds have to be settled around the cell, the, the cell to different compartments. And, and these RABs are the critical mediators of this settling. They, they, they take things from one compartment to another compartment in the cell. And without RABs working properly, the cell can't undertake its everyday, its everyday functions. So the, so the data shows that LRRK, this, this is a technical slide, but we, we know the, 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 the chemical structure you know, of the RAB, and LRRK2 attaches a phosphate group right in the middle of the business end of this RAB enzyme and stops its activity by doing so. So what happens is that Patients with LRRK2 mutations will have elevated, inappropriately elevated LRRK2 activity. This will result in too much phosphorylation of RAB, and this will therefore stop its normal function of settling things around the cell. And the hope is that if you can develop an LRRK2 inhibitor, you can reduce the phosphorylation of RABs, reactivate it, and then enable it to, you know, continuing its, its settling results. These are the data that I look at every day in the lab that I think are terribly exciting because, you know, this, this is the, the methodology at the moment that we use to study RAB phosphorylation in, you know, in cells. And what we discovered is that you can look at RAB and you can see it on a gel here. So using the techniques we use here, we can separate the, the, the LRRK2 phosphorylated RAB. So you can see this is the LRRK2 phosphorylated RAB. You know, in a, in a, in a, this is a skin cell from a patient. So this is the active form of the RAB, and this is the inhibited form of the RAB. But what's very exciting is that we've taken three different drugs from three different companies, from GSK, Ross, and Merck, 
that target with LRRK2, and we add those two cells, and you can see that this inhibits LRRK2, therefore inhibits the phosphorylation of the LRRK2 protein, and then and, and you lose this band. So that, that was hugely exciting results. And then the other really e exciting result was we wanted to see what happens when you um, introduce a Parkinson's disease causing mutation into, in, into a mouse. Basically, the, the key here is to see if you can use this diagnostically to diagnose in patients potentially you know, whether you have a mutation or an environmental or some other factor that activates LRRK2, can you see elevated LRRK2 biology in, in a cell? And so th these are cells from a mouse which is a wild type that don't have a mutation. These are cells from a mouse that have a Parkinson's disease causing mutation. And I think you can see quite easily that this results in a very big increase in the amount of LRRK2 phosphorylated RAB that you know, confirms our theory that you know, activating LRRK2 by mutations switches on RAB phosphorylation. And when you add the GSK drug, obviously, you, 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 you remove this phosphorylation both in the, uh, in the, even in the mutant patients. So this is promising that the patients with the mutations could be treated with, with the drug. RABs are, have been linked to Parkinson's disease before. Out of the 18 genes I showed you on this table, you can notice two, two of these genes are RABs. They're called RAB7L1 and RAB39B. And, and some other genes have also been involved in this biology of vesicular trafficking that um, RABs regulate. Also, very excitingly, the pink one kinase that my colleague uh, Miratul Mukit and others work on in Dundee has also been shown to regulate, you know, RAB biology and vesicular trafficking. And, 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 then, and the, actually, the first, the first discovery that RABs were involved in Parkinson's disease was made in the late 1990s by, by, by a very, very famous American uh, molecular biologist called Susan Lindquist, who unfortunately passed away last week from, you know, you know, from cancer, which is very sad. But she discovered in the late 1990s that the toxic effects of alpha-synuclein, you know, in, in, in animal models of Parkinson's disease could be reversed by overexpression of RABs. So I think there's a huge amount of evidence now starting to emerge that suggests that the RABs are really like the heart of understanding uh, the Parkinson's disease, and these are the molecules that are disrupted. Any exciting discovery in biology, unfortunately, doesn't solve the problem. It always it just leads to 10 more exciting questions that need to be answered. And, you know, so the, the key question is that we know now that mutations activate LRRK2 to phosphorylate RABs, but I'm very interested to study the do other environmental factors, infectious agents, other things that cause Parkinson's disease also lead to the activation of, of LRRK2. Although we know RABs control this vesicular movement around the cells, we still don't really understand properly, precisely, what's, what is the key biology that RABs uh, is controlling in cells. And, and that is, you know, an urgent question that needs to be addressed. Um, you, you know, and, and then also, then obviously, not only defining that biology, you know, linking it to, to Parkinson's disease still needs, you know, much more, you know, research. And I, I was, I've kept things simple in my talk, but it turns out that we've discovered that there's actually 14 different RABs. They're very, very similar to each other. There's very few differences that are targeted by LRRK2. And, and the key now is, uh, this is a slight complication because we need to now work out which of these 14 is the, is the critical ones for, you know, for, for Parkinson's disease and which ones are only relevant for you know, other biology. And you know, the key question obviously is that, I told you only 1% of patients have uh, par LRRK2 mutations, but I think it's likely that many patients with normal non-genetic Parkinson's disease will have, uh, will have other disruptions that will switch on this pathway. And the key question is, how do you identify this? How do you know whether you're one of these patients that have sw this pathway switched on? And, and to do this, you know, obviously, one, one of the things we're trying is to see whether we can do this as, an, as, as a blood test. And this is a recent result of the last few weeks of work in our lab. We've taken human neutrophils, which is a type of white blood cell from, that's easily available from, you know, from blood. And, and, and by using this, we can also, in human blood, 
detect, you know, these are from donors without Parkinson's disease. We can detect, you know, for the first time phosphorylated rare proteins in, in the blood. This is still early days of this research, but what we hope is very soon is to, 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 to see if we can then get blood from uh, Parkinson's disease patients to see whether or not we can see elevation of rab phosphorylation in blood. And if we do, that would be very exciting because then it means that those patients might be able to be suitable to qualify for all these LRK2 drug trials that are going to start.